Bibles. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 11. Mike, I'll go back and pick, I'll pick up John 18 in a second, but we'll start in, in Genesis chapter 11. Pray you've had a good week. Pray God has blessed you. Amen. I know in my life I've been blessed over and over again. I, I, get, I, I, am, I, I stand amazed at, at uh, funerals. It was packed yesterday at the New Caney campus, and I kept having people. In, when, again, when the director comes to you and says, man, that was good, and you know that director has heard 100 preachers already this year, and some, but we made it as personable as I could. And then people say, when I die, I, want, I don't even know these people. When I die, I want you to do my funeral. And I look at them and go, I might go before you. You know, I just, uh, it's not something that you, that you planned. It's just something that happens. And, but to have some understanding of, of what's next, to pray and believe God for the best of what's happening next is uh, amazing. I am a kingdom man. I think kingdom. I, I see things as spiritual and secular. I see things as light, and I see things as dark. Uh, Mike, the scripture in John 18, Jesus said this, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. When you understand that, you'll pick up in scriptures that we are ambassadors of another kingdom. That God had a thought of you and put you through a mother's womb to get you here. And because of that, we all came with purpose to do what God called us to do. The fight that's going on right now in America and in the world, and I am not against the protest, uh, I'm against the rioting. And so, and I think most of you stand that way, but we've seen it over and over and over. And, and, uh, but to make one group happy is to make another group mad. And we see it, the Irish were done wrong, the Italians were done wrong, the Jews were done wrong. Uh, let me tell you, the Native Americans were done wrong. Amen. Amen. So you can just kind of walk down the line and see it. And I'm not trying to demean anything. I am a very pro-life man. I look for, uh, I believe that all life, all unborn life matters. And we seem to forget that. We, we forget that that happens. There's only one time that I know in 5,000 years of known history that the world was in unity. One time in 5,000 years of known history. I say known history. I know people say, well, we, the earth is a million years. I don't know how they know how old the earth is. But this here tells me that there was five, at least 5,000 years of known history. Out of that known history, there's only one time the world was together in unity. Are you comfortable? Well, I was. You started this message off, Pastor. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Now, you know why you use bricks instead of stone? Because bricks are uniformed and they're easily stacked, Right? Stone takes a little while. When God created the church, the Bible calls us living stones, not made bricks. That's why it takes so long for all of us to finally get together. Amen. Because you've got to knock off the rough edges. You've got to deal with all type of ways that you came up. And then you've got to say, okay, where do I fit in this scheme of the local body? So they use bricks. Verse 4. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down. Now, now they said, or we'll be scattered. The issue was this. The Tower of Babel issue is that God had already told the people to scatter. He told them to tell you, look, I made you this big, beautiful earth. Go, go and explore. Go, go settle the earth. But instead, because they had one common language, they all came together and stayed in one place. They, they huddled up, if you would. We can call it New York City. I don't know. Let me mention New York City to you. I interviewed Roxanne Berrysford this week, and it'll be on Facebook and Instagram and others. But Roxanne was a, a, a respiratory nurse who spent nine weeks in a hospital in New York City, treated over 300 patients. 
They had 1,000 people in the hospital that hosts 650, and all of them were COVID. She was tested for uh, COVID before she left. She's negative uh, after all the things she went through. It's an amazing interview. Amen. If, you, if you're curious about somebody who was in the hotbed of this thing, uh, we interviewed for about 15, 20 minutes, maybe even longer. So uh, that'll be on this week. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. This is why it is called Babel, because after he, he changed their language, it sounded like Babel. It's just babbling going on. Because there, the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, when you read this, you'd say, why would God want to do this? Because he told them, I want you to scatter. So he gives them all different languages. So when we look around the world, what do we see? Different languages everywhere. And if you've ever been to another country, or if you try to communicate with somebody that doesn't speak your language, you realize real quick how divisive that can be. And, you know, I've tried to speak a little Spanish, and Jos uh, Josiah will laugh at me and go, you don't want to say that. <laughs> you, you don't, 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 don't say that word, Pastor. Just because you heard it on TV don't mean it's a good word for you to say. You know, because I've heard some words, and I've used them, and they go, no, that's not nice to say that. And I, even right now, one of them words are trying to come out of my mouth, and I'm trying to hold it back. I don't, I don't want to say that word. Amen. I don't want to be offensive in that way, because language can get you in a lot of trouble. I can take you places in Alabama I would have to interpret for you. I promise you. And I would have to, matter of fact, I would have to help them understand what you're saying, because you, you think they're confused. Father, I love you. I thank you for the word of God. I seek the answers in your book. God, I seek for truth in your book. God, I, I, I seek to understand. So God, give us a spirit of understanding this morning. And God, let our hearts be welled up with the fact that you are for us and not against us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. God wasn't against them. Matter of fact, look at this powerful verse, and I want you to catch it. The Lord said in verse 6, If as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. This is the principle of unity, that if we decide to get together in one language or one way of doing stuff, there's nothing impossible for us. So when I look at it, I say, man, this is something, man. Why, why didn't God just go down and destroy the tower? Why didn't he just knock the city down? Be, uh, instead of getting on different languages? Because had he done it, they would just rebuilt it again. The issue, my friend, is adversity doesn't affect unity. Adversity doesn't affect unity. As a matter of fact, adversity often brings us together. When we came together during the floods, we've come together uh, dealing with this COVID, we've come together through all type of adversity. Adversity brings us together. So again, they could have rebuilt it. The word unity is a condition of harmony. When we hear music up here, with, this is unity, when all of them are together. But if one hits a bad note, y'all remember Richard Golightly? He, was, he always hit bad notes. <laughs> I hope you're watching, Richard, this morning. Amen. Uh, <laughs> when they, when you, if you leave here, I'm going to talk about you. I just promise you straight up, so you want to stay right here. Amen. But if you hit a bad note, everybody knows it. It's out of harmony. So unity is everything, and it actually tends toward musical. Everything is in harmony. Uh, unity is power achieved. It's when you, when you work together, it's power achieved. Building the tower was a power achieved. The Godhead is unity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless the Father gives me a green light. Amen. The Holy Spirit's the same way. So when these three come together, there is nothing more powerful than the Trinity, than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost making a decision to do something. That is, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Well, two or three gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So God is about promoting unity, but it's all within the kingdom of God. It's all within staying right here. There's something about knowing this that I believe there'll never be unity on this earth again. We, got, we speak too many languages. We have, oh, we have economic issues. We have educational issues. We have racial issues. We have all kinds of issues. But in the church, everybody say the church. In the kingdom of God, this is the place where unity can be found. Amen. And we have to work on it. We have to say, you know what? Here's the issue. Uh, unity is when democracy, oh my goodness. We're set up from 200 years ago to be divided. We have never been the United States of America. 
It's never happened. We want to believe this pipe dream, but it's never going to happen. See, the issue is this. We're the people. Uh, we want the head to agree with the people. That's democracy. We want the head to agree with us. I don't care if it's Trump, Obama, Clinton, uh, Clinton, uh, Bush, Bush, Reagan. It don't matter who it is. We're never going to get the head to agree with the people. Real unity is when the body agrees with the head. And if I look at the head and I realize the head is not a president, the head is not a governor, the head is not a mayor, but the head is Jesus Christ, then we can all get to agreeing under him and say, all right, I can agree with him. He died for me. He loves me. He lived a sinless life. Amen. He was a real martyr. Everything about him speaks of, of unity, of love, of peace and joy. I can get under him and say, I agree with him. And it doesn't matter what culture you come from, what education you you got what race you are we can agree with Jesus oh my god I didn't know I'd preach this good already Paul Paul got Paul is a is a Pharisee the Pharisees he understood division he was all about dividing he was dividing up the church he was there when Stephen was was stoned to death he had permission to kill Christians that's what he had in his life amen so what he did was when he got born again he tried to unify the church and he knew the one power of unity is what we did last Sunday and that is take communion Common union, to have something together. And the church in Corinth, he rebukes them. He gets onto them in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. He said, in the following directives, and the things that I've already shared with you, I have no praise for you. But, you know, it's the hardest thing in the world for a pastor to have to rebuke his church. And that's what he's doing right now. He's chewing on them. He said, your meetings, your coming to church on Sunday is doing more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions, division. A division is two visions, multiple visions, not having the right vision, if you would. There are divisions among you. Uh, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there has to be differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. In other words, uh, what I got going on makes God like me more than he likes you. You see what he's saying here? All right. So... Uh, then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. You're not, you're not doing communion correctly. This is, this is wrong what you're doing. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Where? In the church. Hmm. This is where I, I struggle with people that say that that, that juice they drank was, was grape juice. They didn't drink wine. They drank wine. Amen. They had wine. But they were, they were teetotalers. You're supposed to hit the, get a hit and leave it alone. Amen. Some folk can handle it. Some folk can't handle that. I preached in Florida for years at a, a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center known as Faith Farm. It was in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Boynton Beach, Okeechobee. And they had communion. And, they, and here are men who are come off of alcohol. And they got... They're serving wine at communion. Did you know every communion service was packed in that building? <laughs> One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Verse 18 said there were divisions among you. No doubt there has to be differences among you to show uh, which one of you has God's approval? Uh, the cause, which of you have God's approval? Division causes sickness. We, we've seen that already in our world. It causes sickness. Verse 29 and 30, if you went on down, it'd say, uh, you've not learned to discern, recognize, understand the body. You had not figured out what's really going on here spiritually. When we break communion, instead of making communion, according to verse 30, that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. The word fallen asleep means backslide, to fall away. You, 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 you've gotten sick because you've not discerned the body of Christ. You're not working together in unity. When there's unity in the body, there's healing in the body. Amen. When people are together in the body, we have, we have healing here. Good things are happening. Miracles begin to take place. But what has happened is there's divisions. Now, the church world has seen its, its shared divisions. There's, there's economic divisions. There's church culture. There's education. And there's race. And I'm just going to touch on these very quickly. But the first division, of course, economic division. Division caused by an economic status. 
uh, big guys, little youths, uh, more wealthier than others. And, and I, I travel a lot, and I see churches from, from barns, wore out buildings to great steeples, amen, uh, for the sheeples. Uh, they, 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 there's, there's an elaborate, you know, and, and sometimes you feel almost intimidated to go into certain buildings that are very, very nice. You think, well, I'm not dressed appropriately. I don't look right. Well, what that's called is an economic division among people. So I think something about having, for us, having a church that's somewhere in the middle there is a good thing. But I want to say, I don't care how, much, how wealthy you are, you're welcome here. How poor you are, you are welcome here. That somehow, someday, churches have to learn how to sit together no matter what their economic status is. Amen? So it's very important to do that. Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, for everyone to whom much is given much is required you'll find out as you get older in the kingdom of God and you start receiving more then it's important for you to release more amen if God can get it through you he can get it to you hallelujah so he's always looking for us to understand that it's not about hoarding up or holding on to but learning how to release and to uh, realize that we are required from this and from the one who has been entrusted with much much more will be asked. you got to ask yourself, when God really starts blessing you, evidently he trusts me. And if he trusts me, then he believes I'm going to do the right thing with what he's blessed me with. Amen. And when we understand that, all of a sudden the division of eco economics starts falling away. The second is culture. Every church has a culture. Every church. Well, our church, the little country church, has a culture to it. There's something, it's the reason we're called the little country church. We may be in the town of Crosby, but we still country. Amen. At least we most of us love country. Now, if you were, you've never been in city, ain't nobody unless you've lived in concrete all your life. I, I, I feel for those folk, but that's their life. That's where they at. That's what they love. I love country. He said, Pastor, y'all got snakes where you at? Hallelujah. I'd really have snakes and some of them big rats I've seen running around. Amen. I, I mean, I, I'm used to snakes. You know, church culture, there's division among it. Well, it's where taste and personal preference quickly escalate into immovable doctrines and division. If I said this, worst team in football is LSU. <laughs> so what I just did then is I created a, a division based off cultural, Right? Then you know where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll give LSU one. But Ole Miss ain't never going to get his Sam. I'm just telling you straight up. You A&M fans, God love you. I, I love you. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah hook them horns or whatever, whatever it is y'all do. I forget what it is y'all do. Okay, oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. You see what I mean? It's cultural. It's cu these things are cultural. So, so to keep division down, I, I even had to learn a long time ago, you know, I had to quit saying so much about, about football because it did affect certain people. Amen. But you're never going to find one church that's just got Longhorns in it. You're never going to find one church that's got uh, uh, LSU in it or A&M in it. Or, 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 it's not going to happen. Even in Alabama, you're not going to find that. Well, maybe in Alabama, you're going to have Auburn on one side and Alabama. But, but either way, every church should closely mirror the composition of the community it serves. So I look at our community, and I've been in this area for 30-something years now, and I say, I want us to mirror the culture in which we serve. The man that I buried yesterday, Barry uh, Johnson, actually lived on Baptist Encampment Road, but never came to our church until Susie, his wife, was invited to go down there by a man named Mr. Deason, who was a coon hunter who ended up on our property hunting coons. Okay, now if you're a coon hunter and you're hunting coons on our property, that is culturally relevant. Are you still hearing me? Because you can take all them coons out of there you want. Just go ahead and get all them out of there. So that's what this old man would do. So he invited Susie down. Susie invited Barry down. Barry said, I didn't know this existed down here. He started, started shooting skeet with us because of the culture, because we're not anti-gun. Okay, so with, with, with four guns, God and, and, and family. Can I get an amen? So we started seeing our culture... It deals with our zip code. Culture is the set of shared attitudes, values, and goals that characterize congregation and community. Now, what's important is there are times people will walk into a church and realize that culturally they don't fit. They just, they, they, they don't work with it. We always used to phrase uh, the 4-H club, Harley's Hot Rods, Horses, and Impian Hell. 
If you fall into those four, and you say, well, I don't, I don't do Harleys, Hot Rods, or Horses, but, but, but you like to win people to Jesus, you're in the right church. Because all we do is use those things to win people to Christ. Amen. The word win means something to us. Win the loss, integrate the body, and nurture people. When we do that, we're, we're creating a culture. When we use the phrase holy wild, we're creating a culture to help people understand we're a risk-taking outfit. Amen. We don't just sit back and we're not passive, uh, but we believe that the church is aggressive. When, we, when you think that the, uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. These are culturally, uh, so when I walk into a church, one of the first things I had to do as an evangelist when I traveled was pick up on the culture of that church because I did not want to uh, transgress against it or cause more division in the church. I wanted to pick up on it. I remember years ago, I was preaching in Somerville, Tennessee. And while I was preaching there, they had worship. And then they called worship. Uh, everybody got up. This is a true story. Everybody got up in the congregation and came forward and stood at the altar and turned and faced the guest in the building and worshiped. And I thought to myself, this, I ain't into this. Can you imagine being a guest in church and everybody in the church came forward and you're the only four people sitting there and everybody's singing to you and in, in the middle of the singing, the pastor walked over and whispered in my ear, Pastor Jerry, you're standing on the girl's side. The men stood on one side of the church and the women stood on the... Who started this? See, to me, that was divisive. But I had to flow with it. I was in a church in Redding, California preaching. And, and I, 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 I'm in the church. I don't know a whole lot about it. A friend of mine uh, named John Cook had just took the church. And there were two churches that merged together, uh, an older church and younger church. They merged together economically to help be able to, to survive and make the building. They had probably 150, 200 people in the church. And they, they, they grabbed them hymnals, and they stood up and started singing out of them hymnals. So I reached and found me a hymnal. I'm not good at it, but I, I, can, I, can, I can fake it till I make it. So I grabbed a hymnal, and I started singing along with them. Hallelujah. Yeah. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Da, 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 da. Amen. Amazing grace. How sweet that sound. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. So I said, and, and when, when the songs were over, when, 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 so, so that was one guy leading out of a hymnal. Then he sat down, and a young man got up on a guitar and started singing, and they put the songs up on the overhead, and half the church that was singing with the hymnal sat down. And the other half is standing up worshiping. And all of a sudden I realized they two churches inside this church. You follow where I'm going? So we had this division in the church. And I thought, God, this is not what you want. You don't want division in this house. Amen? So, so culture is another. What's the next one? The third one. Education. You know, education can divide people. You know, you can hear people talk and say to yourself, that person's not real educated. And you might misjudge that person. They may have a degree from A&M. <laughs> oh, I'm picking now. I hope y'all come back next week. That was more like Mississippi. Is that where the toothbrush was invented? <laughs> okay. Well, I apologize. I apologize. So anyway, if you're not laughing, I can't help you. Let, let, let me go. Let me just tell you about culture just a little bit more before I get into education here. This is a, we have white collar people in this church. But we're basically blue collar. Amen. Uh, there is something about us. We do. There is an appreciation for freedom and guns. And, there, and when I say guns, I'm not talking about violence. You know, I was just talking with Deborah this morning. She, she learned to shoot a shotgun so she can shoot quail. That just makes me happy. I get happy when people just, you know, are pressing outside of a comfort zone. Yesterday, I had two students from a college show up with Jill, my daughter from Oral Roberts University, young girl from Fort Worth, never shot a gun. How many know that's a crime? Never saw a gun. I took her out with my, my 12 gauge, my 45, my, and 22, and I let her work her way all the way up till she blew a pumpkin up. You never seen a little girl smile as big as she did. Amen. There's something about our culture. Our culture leans toward that. There's something that's very important. Now, getting on education, we have people that are educated beyond their intelligence. 
I, I mean, my dad would use the term, uh, didn't have enough sense to get out of rain. Uh, just, just uh, they're too smart for their own good. Uh, they got they got so many degrees, Doctor Fahrenheit. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. But in in just because you got uh, book learning, don't mean you got smarts. Amen. There's something about common sense and learning how to work together with that. But I will say this: readers are leaders. When you learn how to read, you learn how to lead, and you got to keep reading. You got to keep staying at it. You got to keep educating yourself. You got you can't be afraid to educate yourself. You can't be afraid to live, listen to other people's different opinions about things. Amen. You can't have just itching ears about what you want to hear all the time. So this is not an excuse for fools or to be arrogant. The fourth one is what we're dealing with, of course, today is uh, so much over our land is racial division. It always brings tension. Anytime race is brought up, it brings tension into our lives. You didn't ask for your pigmentation. Mm -mm. That was God's will and your parents' decision. And that's what brought you into this world. It doesn't make you a big I or a little you. Amen. It makes you who you are. They're, they're, everybody has a color to them. Red, yellow, black, white. Amen. Brown. It, whatever color God puts in your life. Amen. That's who you are. Don't lift that up and become arrogant with it and make, it, make you think that somehow it separates you. There's no superiority with being uh, any different color in your life. Amen. Come on. Give me amen. Listen, my friend, religious spirits find fertile ground in racist hearts. Almost every racist I ever met was religious. They would use religion as a way to justify their hate toward another race. Uh, all colors are welcome. Matthew 6, 10, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus speaking. Revelation, what's going on in heaven? Every kindred and tongue and people. When we get to heaven, every kindred, tongue, and people, it almost sounds like God's going to let us keep our pigmentation when we get there. Amen. That we're not going to be, everybody's going to be blue. Or we're all going to be a bunch of Martians when we get there, green. Amen. That ain't going to happen. We're going to look like a, like a bag full of Skittles when we get there around the throne. Hallelujah. Amen. Worshiping God together because we will be in heaven. Causes of division. The biggest cause of division is idolatry. Whatever you idolize. When you be, you know, I picked on football a while ago. When you idolize one football team, how many know you demonize another? It's just what we do. Amen. I, I've used this for you before, but if you idolize your race, you demonize other races. If you idolize your culture, you demonize other cultures. If you idolize our, your nation, you demonize other nations. If you idolize your education, you demonize the less educated. If you idolize your gender, you demonize other genders. If you idolize your political party, you demonize other political parties. When we idolize, we are finding our identity in our tribe, our culture, our nationality, and we declare war on their tribe their color, their nationality, and that's uh, identity idolatry. That's what it is. Assuredly, Paul was upset over this. Some of what was going on, he said to them, the reason there's divisions among you is because you're trying to show yourself better than other people. You're idolizing. Amen. Some of what was going on here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and it's what's behind what we call racism, classism, sexism, and the like. Our identity must be found in Christ. I am a son of God. You are daughters and sons of God. We must take our place as ambassadors of the kingdom of God and the king sent to earth for a purpose. I'm here to represent one, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And if I fail at that, I have failed. I've got to represent him in all the things that I do. Well, Pastor, what is the cure for, for, uh, uh, for, for division? Tough word. Tolerance. See, I, I've preached this to you forever. What you choose to tolerate will never change. You've heard me say it. If you choose to talk, but that's in my personal life. Uh, January, I started fasting. I was, I was uh, 245, bumping 250 at Christmas. I looked at my face. I realized, Jerry, you, you're looking a little bit heavy. And I've been here before. I've been here before. I'm not, I'm not boasting myself. But I, I'm, I'm down over 40 pounds since then. And the reason why is I chose to quit tolerating because for some of you, you can carry it. But with, with the, the things that I was born with, uh, 40 pounds off, my friend, is huge for my legs. Amen. Now, I lost my butt in, in the battle. <laughs> That's right. I said it. I lost my butt in the battle. But, but I'm, I'm going to be all right. Amen. <laughs> I can live without certain things. But tolerance. 
Learning how to tolerate a sympathy or indulgence for beliefs or practices differing from or conflicting with one's own. There has to be a tolerance for the black community. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean you need to look at this thing and realize, yes, they have been policed hard. Yes, they have been uh, uh, separated a lot. of And I know every race has. But right now the attention is there. And yes, that man was murdered. I mean, there's no other way to look at it. But I got so many great police officer friends that have never done anything near that or like that. And I stand with the blue also. So there has to be tolerance on all sides for the world. But the world is never going to see peace. You're never going to have it. Amen. It's not going to happen. So in the church world. I would say that all educational, amen, all cultural, all, all, all races, amen, learn to tolerate one another. Learn how to deal with one another. Learn how to love one another. I, I know some of you, bless your heart, you, 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 you're more country than I am. Whoa. I try to tell you how country I am, but you country. I can hear it every time you open your mouth. Some of you got a little city in you. I always ask, well, where are you from? I can't help myself. Where are you from? And they'll, they'll like be from England or Russia. I don't know. Second from come here about Russia. Unless I get around that young lady right there. I know where Vladivostok is. My brother-in-law was a missionary there for a season. But that's on the other end of the world of Russia. Near Japan. So, so but I'd have, to, I'd have to hang out with someone and listen to and tolerate. I asked Josiah quite a bit. You know, Josiah is Hispanic, Mexican. I know. No, it's not. You told me the other day, just because I said Hispanic don't mean you was Mexican. Don't you go there with me. (laughs) Hispanic south of the border, Mexican is Mexico. And I said, how do you like the food? Do you know what he's doing? He's learning to tolerate it till he likes it. And he says some of it is very good. It's very good. And vice versa, right? You're eating that Taco Bell now, right? Authentic Mexican food. Yeah, yeah. Let me say it again. Tolerance. Tolerance. A sympathy or indulgence for beliefs or practices differing from or conflicting with one's own. I've often said, again, what I choose will never change. But that's in the personal areas of my life. There there are things that I have to change. There there are certain people in your life. You've got to quit tolerating them. You have to quit tolerating because all they're going to do is suck the life out of you. Amen. You just got to learn how to say no and walk away from a, a certain things. But then there are things about people, what I mean in general around, that I have to learn to tolerate. 1 Corinthians 9, 20, Paul said, even though I'm free, I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone. I'm free. That, that is a liberating statement, by the way. I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone. I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. I I have learned to be a little smarter. I've learned to be a little bit more culturally. I've learned to deal with races a lot more. I've learned to deal with people. Why? So that I may win some. I want to win some. I do all this for the sake of Christ, of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. My goal is to win people to Christ. In order to do that, I've got to learn how to uh, assimilate myself into their lifestyle. I'm not a biker. I've been riding a motorcycle since I was 12. But I'm not a biker. But I can run with bikers. I'm, I, I, can't re- I can't rebuild an engine. I know what a carburetor is. I know where to put gas. I can change the spark plugs and a belt. But don't look at me like somehow I know all the little uh, nuances of hot rods, but I can run with the hot rods. Are you hearing me? I'm not a cowboy. We took my mama's dress and, 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 and tore it up. Me and my brother did when we were 8, 9, 10 years old and made a bridle for our horses and crawled up on center blocks and barebacked horses around the field. But that didn't make me a cowboy. That just gave me a butt whooping when I got off of it for tearing my mama's dress up. But I've rode horses, and I've been thrown by the best of them and hospitalized. I have. But I'm not a cowboy, but I can run with the cowboys. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Paul said, I became all things to all people that I might win some. And I simulated my life. I'm trying to break down the walls. I'm trying to deal with them. I've never been in the military, but I've been around enough military men and women to help me understand. A little bit more about how important it is 
to have a country that is protected by the greatest military force on the planet of the earth. Amen? Amen. The message, the message Bible says it like this in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious. See, some folk are so religious, they are no heavenly good. You're just too religious. I can't even talk to you without you going into a scripture or, or, or bubbling over a brother or a sister or something. I just wish every now and then you, a cuss word would slip from your lips and you show me you're human. <laughs> just too religious. So Paul said, I, I, but with a le- but meticulous moralist, loose living moralist. What he's actually saying is, I can become as moral as you. But on the flip side, loose living and moralist. He didn't say I became one, but in order to win them, I got around them. Keep rolling. Next verse. The defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I didn't, I didn't become them. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. Have you ever heard somebody say, you need to walk in their shoes. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed in that, when, when, especially when I'm out at the ranch, I see such a multicultural, educational race. I see that where, where I live among the people that I hang out with. But you got to put yourself in their shoes at some time. Amen. You got to walk in them and realize what, what it is they like, what it is they've gone through. And when you do that, you change perspectives. Paul's, Paul was an arrogant man. He had to be arrogant to do the thing. Because he even said it. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was a Benjamite. I, I, I kept, I knew the first five books of the Bible front to back. I, I, this is who I was. I was religious. But you know what? I got to a place in life. I would humble myself. I would tolerate people. I just wanted to win people to Jesus. Amen. And if we miss this mission of winning people to Jesus, eh, then we've missed everything. Everything about us is to bring somebody with us to heaven with us. Amen. To reach out to them, to connect to them, to see things a little bit different than the way we were. That's why I'm always talking about where I came from, because I want you to feel what it was like to be in my shoes. Boots. Let me close. Psalm 133, 1. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. God didn't say he was against you. He's for unity. He's for you and I tie. That's what unity means, to tie together. Did you know, uh, uh, you can be together and not be in unity. You know that? Yeah. You can take two cats, tie their tails together, and throw them over a clothesline. You got togetherness. No, don't ask me how I know. But you don't have unity. Unity is different. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the beard, on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. This is Moses' brother. Down upon the collar of, the ro- of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessed, even life forevermore. The results of unity were two phases here. First was a fragrance, a precious oil, descends from the top. It was like you could smell the unity. You understood it. When, when there's something that is foul, it drives you away from it. Walking into the office this week, there's something outside this office. Oh. You got away from it as quick as you could. And then I was walking to my truck, and I looked, and there it was, a dead squirrel. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my son, Josiah, and I said, Josiah, take that squirrel out to the woods. Get it away from me. That thing decaying. Because when you got a foul odor, it drives you away. But a sweet fragrance, Mm -hmm. oh, pulls you in. He said it's like the fragrant dew. He said, then he said, a fragrance flowing down. It's anointing oil. And then he said, it's like the dew. There are places that receive very little rain, but the dew was so heavy, it would cause crops to grow. Mm-hmm. And there in that place, the dew was so heavy, so thick, it would cause things to grow. Fruitfulness. When there's unity, there's growth. There's growth together. Heavy dew in the east is vital to the well-being of the crops. It removes dryness out of your life. It brings fulfillment. I believe what God's looking for in the house is a commitment from a church to work together in unity. I've seen churches have mutiny, divide, split up, 
We've been very fortunate. I have been very fortunate. I've been pastoring now since 1993. In the reality, I've never had a church split. But I've seen split after split after split after split. And I believe one reason we haven't had it is because we strive for unity. Now we tolerate one another. You've tolerated me. I know you have. I know I have done things and said things and you went, oh dear God. You've heard stuff. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I had a pastor friend do that all the time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He said it all the time. Archie Webb, yeah, Archie. out Marysville, California. He had, he had great big thick glasses. He was one of the oldest living pair, uh, uh, free bleeders. You know, it gets cut and you bleed to death. He's one of the oldest one of those guys left on in America. I, I was sitting with him at a conference once, and this guy was preaching, and he was terrible. <laughs> he, was ter he was awful. And, and Archie couldn't help himself. He just went, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God help him, Jesus, Jesus. And he shoved his glasses up. And I'm starting to laugh at him until the, I don't even remember the sermon, but I remember Archie. <laughs> That's funny. Committed, a simulation, being absorbed into the life of a unified body. As we move through the connect groups, prayer meetings on Tuesday night, our widows and widowers meeting, amen, our lift meeting, our swap meetings, as we move through the connect meetings, if you will decide, you know what, I've never been to one, but I'm just going to go try it out. Assimilate yourself into a meeting this month. Uh, ride with Zion's Lines to Hot Springs, Arkansas with us. You, you decide you just want to go along or drive behind us, whatever. Amen. But you assimilate yourself into a meeting. And you, you get absorbed into that. Then you realize that there are people in this group that I needed to be around. Unity requires closing ranks and minimizing our differences so that there can be a deeper involvement. It's going to take tolerance. Involvement means adjusting our lives so that we are participants and not just spectators. You look at your life and say, well, I don't have time for that. Are you lying? Or have you just not made time for it? You have to decide to make time for it. John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You, lo you love one another. Why do we want the little country church to grow? Because there are people out there who are far off. They're alienated. They're separated. They feel because of their education, they can't find a church. Because of their, their race, they can't find a church. Because of their culture, they can't find a church. What if they came here and you loved them anyway? You assembled them anyway. Didn't that happen for all of us? Didn't God do that for all of us? We want them to meet Jesus and be a part of the church family. We want to get to know them. Hey, and if you stack your life next to mine and we love each other, when we become the people of God, maybe this church will affect another church. This week, this week I called Bishop Ron Eagleton, Mount Rosa Church, Church of God. How you doing, Brother Ron? He said, oh, we're we hanging in there, Pastor. He, he loves me. I love him. We just talk. We have the most genuine conversations. I can ask him almost anything. I can ask him to help me. Help me understand a little bit better. This week I called Keenan Smith, Crosby. How you doing, man? You doing okay? Things good for you? Amen. Y'all getting it together? Good deal. I call pastors. I check on them. I, love, I, don't, I don't have a begrudgingness in me. I tolerate. I've learned to tolerate. Amen. I've watched God turn things around. Where you sit, let me talk to you. Something, something you hit today, Pastor. Last week when I finished preaching, I got messages and said, Pastor, you help me understand just a little bit more than what I understood. That's all I'm doing today. I want us all to understand just a little bit more. With heads bowed, eyes closed. You saved. You're going to heaven. You love Jesus. But there are things in your life you know that you want God to put a finger on, help you deal with it and get over it. Perhaps it was in this message today. Bet you put your hand up real quick and back down. See, all these hands tell me we're going to have unity in this house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray over the congregation, the Crosby campus, or the little country church, and those that are watching us online. God, that we become more tolerant toward those with educational differences in our life. 
for those who have cultural differences in our life, that we can love them and speak into their life, those that have a different race. God, we, we were all born one way or another. God, this way that we're born, we ask that you help us, give us understanding. Let us walk in their shoes. God, economic differences. Lord, I'm praying for prosperity for this house. Nobody should have to live from, from check to check. God, they should be able to save up. There is a dream which is called America. God, I'm praying that we still press into it. We haven't lost it yet. I'm praying for jobs and better jobs for people. I'm praying for them to work a job till they find their career. I ask you to bless this body of believers. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ronnie, are they tithing offering envelopes? Everybody got them there? Okay. Everybody get an offering envelope. We've got to accelerate our giving. Look when I say that. If everybody would just literally believe God for your tithe, that 10%, and start honoring God with your tithe, you wouldn't believe how God will bless you. He'll bless you. He'll bless your business. He'll bless that Your boss will come to you and give you a raise because his business is blessed because you've been a blessing. We honor God with our giving. So honor God with your giving today. Amen. If you do it online, if you're watching online and you give online, if you're in another state, again, we would thank God that you're watching. Amen. That you're learning, that you're growing, that you'll share this message with others. H.D. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Y'all going to meet here for prayer, two or more. That's in, open for everyone. June the 11th, Sister Diane, widows, amen, and widowers. She has paperwork. I'd Listen, I hugged Susie Johnson yesterday, and it just hit me. She just became a widow. Just like that, she became a widow. Her whole life has changed. She looked, she looked almost lost had it not been for church. She looked at, hugged me yesterday after, after the funeral. She said, I'll see you tomorrow in church, Pastor. I'm coming. I'll be in church quickly. I got to get back in quickly. Amen. Uh, baptisms next week. If you've not been baptized, please pick up a slip in the back. Notify our office so that we can prepare to baptize you. Amen. Here And, and Sam, I'll fill the water up. We always heat this water back here. It's a little bit warmer than out yonder. So just giving you the heads up. Seniors with a Purpose is going to be meeting June the 14th. Next, that's next Sunday. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, and that's for all the seniors that would like to meet after church. Zion's Lines will be heading June 14th through the 17th. You need to uh, call J. Bo Johnson or call the office. I don't know if there's a sign-up sheet in the back. But I can tell you that uh, you're going to have to make arrangements for your hotel. You know, we stay at the Best Western in Hot Springs. It'll be a, once we get there, there'll be a two-day ride, a Monday and a Tuesday, and we'll come back on a Wednesday. So we're going we're gonna to ride all over Arkansas. So just look forward to that. Hey, I, I love the fellowship of it. I had a friend this week told me. He said, I rode my motorcycle to College Station, and then I rode it back. He said, Pastor, man, and he's rubbing his backside. And, 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 and I said, son, if that ride hurts you, you in trouble when we go to Arkansas. We're going to burn that road all day to get there. You know, and so, uh, but hey, it's okay. The feeling comes back after a while. Lift Bible study, June 21st. It's Diane, how's Charlie? Getting better every day. Praying for Charlie Cream. Amen. Save the dates, guys. June 28th, got a swim day out at the ranch. Love for you guys to come out if you want to swim. The pool looks beautiful. Woo, that pool look good. Finally Amen. Done. Looks good, don't it? Looks finally. Finally. Finally looks good. Uh, little, uh, our kids camp, July 20th through the 22nd. That's $100 a kid. Save the date. Prepare for that. And you adults that would like to go to that, come out and hang out with us. You should have welcomed Jewels for Christ on the 25th, September 27th, Muscle Car Sunday. Would you stand with me? Ronnie, we're going to have a bucket in the back for those that are on their way out. David, why don't you come up and close us with a proclamation. Give me a little time to get to the back. I love y'all. Man, I love y'all. Appreciate you so much. Such a great group. Amen.
My vets are here. When I look back there and I see my vets, I get excited. Amen. Sister Donna, good to see you here. Sister Peggy, amen. Love you guys. means a lot to me to see y'all. Hallelujah. Uh, pray for one another this week. And, uh, you know, we're always out at the ranch. Hey, look, if you want to weed eat, yes. if you want to trim trees, if you want to kill snakes, we your huckleberry. As we give today, we're believing for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom.